really full room. Uh, and um, thank you for our panelists today, which I'll introduce in just a moment. Oh, someone is. Uh... Yes, Julia. Julia, you raised your hand. That might have been an accident. Just so you all know, there's no way for me to get on, on video. It won't let me. I don't have the option. I'm okay like this, but I just want you to know that it's not me. Not Okay, great. On. Okay. Are you hearing me? Uh, yes, Julie. Oh, good. Julia, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. Um, so what I would ask to do, just so we don't have uh, uh, kind of chaos in the meeting, because we have a lot, we have we have uh, maybe 140 registered and they're flowing in. Um, I would ask that if you have questions, that you just put them into the chat. And how you do that is you go to the bottom and you just uh, type it in to you look for the chat. Uh, uh, you look for the chat opportunity down on the bottom there, and then you could type in your question. Uh, so please do that. We will watch the webinar chat as we're going along, and then we will be fielding uh, questions as we go. I want to introduce our topic: uh, foreclosures, timelines, targets, and strategies. And I'd like to say that our this really started. We had a CLE, um, which is a um, a learning opportunity for credits for attorneys, uh, legal credits, uh, you know, a continuing education in the fall. And we had a great, uh, a great a discussion, very robust on foreclosures and tax sales. And then we kind of repackaged it and then uh, brought it to uh, the agent community uh, in January. And we had 150 uh, agents on the call and we had a lot of interest, a lot of engagement and all that during that period of time. And so we thought uh, to go to the next step is to dive a little bit deeper into this subject, to talk a little bit more about short sales, where the opportunities might be for um, you, uh, a, a real estate agent, to, to um, position themselves as subject matter experts in this. And, um, and, and so that's, that's where we're at today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to begin the... Uh, we're going to begin our presentation. Um, so, um, can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay, yep. fantastic. Um, and what I want to do first is I want to introduce our panel. Uh, I want to uh, thank Attorney Jeffrey Marks. And Jeff, maybe just introduce yourself and introduce your firm and maybe some of the experience you have uh, in you know the for area of foreclosure, short sales, and things like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure some uh, a lot of the agents on the call uh, know you, but uh, just take a moment to do that, please. And welcome. And we appreciate your expertise. Sure. Hi, everybody. I am Jeffrey Marks. Nice to meet all of you. I am a real estate attorney. I have been practicing since 2006. I have offices in Arlington Heights and in downtown Chicago, but I cover the entire Chicagoland area. I do work with um, a lot of Baird and Warner and land trust and you know other um, agents and would love to work with you guys um you know i really like uh you know the team that they have in place and they're great people um so uh you know i'd really love to work with you guys uh as far as my practice goes just real estate uh but i handle uh really everything from you know residential commercial short sales um you know hud transactions uh you know wholesalers um, you know, really, you know, investors, developers, you know, any kind of real estate transaction, but it's just transactional. I don't do any litigation. Um, the first seven years of my practice, uh, from when I started in 2006 was all litigation. So I'm very familiar with litigating foreclosure cases and those types of things. I, during the foreclosure, uh, crisis that occurred back, you know, in 2008, I was in court almost every day in foreclosure court, um, litigating foreclosure cases. So I do have a lot of experience in that in all of, you know, Cook County, Lake County, you know, Kane County, Kendall County, uh, DuPage, really everywhere. I've been in all of those foreclosure courts. Um, but like I said, now I'm lucky enough to just do transactional work. Uh, I do have a firm, it's called Bussy and Bussy PC. Uh, I have three full-time paralegals that work for me. And of course I work with um, the lovely uh, Donna Pacini and her husband. Uh, who's also Donna is on this call, so you'll hear from her in a minute. 
Um, and I charge a flat rate of $500 for a regular real estate transaction. Uh, short sales though, um, you know, are different. It's whatever the bank pays. I do have a litigation associate in my firm. Uh, his name is Scott and he does handle any litigation that we have. So foreclosure cases, that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, just a fun fact about me before I uh, was an attorney, I used to design and produce video games. I did the Lilo and Stitch video game for Disney, uh, which was really I didn't fun. know that. Yeah, that's my little ah. fun secret. Great. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, the next I want to introduce our uh, uh, other uh, panelist, um, Lucas Fuxa. Lucas, uh, attorney Lucas Fuxa. Lucas, thanks for being on the call. Uh, please just introduce yourself, your firm, and uh, we're glad to have you. Thanks for having me, Steve. Lucas Fuxa. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm an attorney. I uh, had practiced for 17 years now with my previous firm, Fuxa Korshid LLC and had ventured off to do my own thing just really this this starting year uh, under the name of Fuxa Law Group. And so primarily giving me an opportunity to focus on things that I really want to do, um, which is everything that's real estate focused. So we do a lot of work uh, representing developers and builders uh, in the real estate construction area as well. We do litigation and transactional work so a lot of commercial real estate deals, but a lot of residential ones as well. Anything pertaining to real estate, I could say I've probably done from, you know, obviously the, the basic closings to structuring uh, real estate investment funds. I also actually started and managed a real estate investment fund that happened after the market crash where banks were not very prone to financing new deals. So um, I had pulled together some private investors to create a fund that has done some really remarkable things. Uh, the latest one that has just been sold was at 1425 West Fullerton. If any of you know of that building, it's a nice landmark uh, bank building that we converted into eight luxury condominium units. Uh, so that was a really fun project. Glad to see that that turned out as well as it did, considering how beautiful of a, of a building that is. Um, so yeah, we, in terms of the, the topics that we're going to discuss, I as well had handled a lot of those types of things, short sales, foreclosure, uh, defense. Also, you know, I represented groups that would, would jump in and buy notes from banks, um, wow. at a discount and then, uh, facilitate the, the foreclosure process for those clients. Um, and so anything that that comes our way in terms of real estate both on the transactional and the uh, litigation side we're able to handle our office now is primarily in Park Ridge where I'm at um, I go and handle transactions all throughout the suburbs as many attorneys do so I'll put up my email in uh, that in, in where you see my name displayed Feel right and we'll we'll and we will send uh, out uh, ev uh the panelist information uh to our uh, the, uh all the participants on the call and everyone Excellent. so they'll get they'll get everyone's information but thank you lucas Great. we appreciate that we look forward to hearing from you more and donna donna and i actually have had a relationship uh professional relationship for a while i had my own mortgage and title company uh in the 90s and uh and into 2000 and if you haven't seen the big short uh, you know, you can watch that. And uh, uh, that was a part of my life for sure. Um, and Donna was uh, our a top tier loan officer. And then she kind of pivoted to really helping her client base and others uh, through the really stressful uh, piece of uh, going through a short sale, losing your family home and all that kind of thing, and has become really an expert in negotiating. So Donna, I I know I probably just uh, gave a lot of your bio, but um, is there anything you want to add to that? No, um, nice to meet you all. Thanks for having me on. Um, I've pretty much been doing short sales since the market crashed. And as Steve said before that, I was a loan officer for about 25 years. So I do love to laugh at the fact that I spent 25 years of my life getting people into mortgages in the last 12 or 15, getting them out of them. But uh, that's essentially what where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Great, Donna, thank you. And we look forward, we'll, we'll be, as the questions come in, we will be tapping uh, uh, the, on the shoulder of our expert panel. You know, one of the things that we did uh, at our last call was we sent out this, uh, after our last call, we sent out this flowchart 
And the flow chart created a lot of questions. And so I just thought that we, we would begin by doing a deep dive into the flow chart and really having our panel speak to it to add some color into some of the boxes and squares so that we could take a look at things at a little bit more closely. So let's just first talk, talk about what, ha what is, the, you know, how does the foreclosure process begin, right? So basically you have a mortgage and if you make your scheduled payments on time, there's no action, you're good. You get to live in your home, the bank lets you have it and keep it. And then if you pay it off, it's yours as long as you pay the taxes, okay? However, when it's when you don't make timely payments that um, the, uh, uh, the uh, foreclosure is initiated. And it's usually 90 days or three delinquent payments. And, um, you know, one of the questions that has come up uh, is, is it always 90 days or do banks always go by 90 days? And maybe uh, we'll have, uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, answer that one? Um, so, I mean, there's no, I don't believe that there's a requirement, um, you know, for a general foreclosure for it to be 90 days. Once they're in breach of the contract, they're allowed to foreclose. That's their right. But from a, a perspective, uh, you know, from a larger bank perspective, they all use a standard time period, um, you know, because they're following, you know, federal guidelines. And so, yeah, that's when you're looking at the 90 day time period. And that's pretty standard across the board. But if, if somebody has like a private mortgage, for instance, if I have an investor client who wants to finance a buyer and we record a deed in a mortgage, they don't have to wait the normal 90 days to file a foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and Can then, I jump in uh, there real quick? Yes, absolutely. Uh, from what I've seen, the 90 day thing really depends on what the bank wants to do. Correct. Because I've seen them go way, 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 way past that 90 day thing before they did anything. So mm -hmm. I'd say the biggest confusion with uh, the foreclosure timelines in general is that there is no consistency. You know, mm -hmm. they, they seem to do what they want to do when they want to do it. Mm hmm. 100% to add to that. Yeah, the 90 days is more of a minimum. I, I've right. seen banks where there's been several years and they still haven't filed a foreclosure. Um, when the bank kind of looks at the property, they determine, okay, do I really want to own this property again? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, depending on where that property is located, they may never file a foreclosure or they may file a foreclosure and then never pursue it and never seek judgment on the foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is so, actually a horrible place for the homeowner to be. Yes. Why? Because it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. If you can't sell it and um, they won't pursue the foreclosure, it's unlikely that they're going to do a deed in lieu at that point because they don't want it back. So that just leaves the homeowner on the hook for, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And and if the house deteriorates over time, the homeowner is unlikely to invest any money in the house because it could be foreclosed or taken um, because they're not making their payments. So that leads typically to the home deteriorating. Um, I've seen a number of homes actually, you know, in the city of Chicago uh, be demoed, you know, when they're in a situation like this where the bank just doesn't want, you know, to proceed forward on the property for whatever reason. Okay. And, you know, at the, in this process right now, there's 2.6 million or so homeowners, uh, you know, kind of showing up on our list in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Cook and Collar counties. And there's 15,600 and some odd that are currently in the foreclosure process. Uh, so that just gives you an idea. And that, that number is kind of escalating uh, right now. Um, you know, and, and the other, uh, one of the other questions that is coming up is how, how do people get in touch or how do you find these people if they haven't been foreclosed upon? And I know there's social media. I know there's, you know, positioning yourself as a subject matter expert and a resource when people start falling behind on their mortgage, even if they haven't been uh, filed on foreclosure, um, is a way for you to, you know, start to become a resource for them early on to where then they could, with their team of people, whether it be Jeff, Donna, uh, Lucas, or, you know, or your attorney, you can then start positioning yourself as a resource because if it gets too far along in the process, which we'll talk about, uh, it becomes tougher and tougher to be able to um, really find a good solution for you. So, what, okay. One thing, if I jump, if I could jump in, Steve. Yes, I don't know, absolutely. This, this ninety day reference also is significant, and I don't know if that's what what the slide is alluding to. But Illinois provides for a ninety day right of reinstatement. Mm -hmm. So what that means is, even if the bank does 
initiate foreclosure proceed, proceedings against you, if you make up the balance and pay all charges, including late charges and any other fees required under your loan, then they have to dismiss the case. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a great point. So 90 days to reinstate. Correct. Okay. Well, um, fantastic. Let's continue here. So really, there are four things that once you default, uh, there are four uh, kind of buckets that you're going to wind up falling into. It's uh, either judicial foreclosure, uh, non-judicial foreclosure, and this is kind of just speaking nationally, uh, deed in lieu or short sale. Um, and let's just talk about these just real quick, and then we'll have our panel uh, comment. Oh, we have... Uh, uh, someone is asking if we're able to give foreclosure figures for other counties. Um, you know, I, I can't uh, right off the hand, I can't, but we could uh, give you those figures. So um, you'll just reach out to your, uh, reach out to one of the sales reps uh, that we introduced and you'll be able to, we'll uh, get those figures to them. Um, so from a judicial uh, foreclosure, the court system has jurisdiction over the matter. So uh, maybe just speak briefly because, uh, you know, I, I peep, do, uh, what is a judicial foreclosure and what does it mean when the court system has jurisdiction over the matter? Jeff or uh, Lucas. Yeah. That's, so a, a judicial foreclosure is, a, a, in Illinois, all foreclosures are judicial. Uh, generally, I mean, this is a deed in lieu or a short sale, but a judicial foreclosure means that a foreclosure has to be filed with the court. It's um, governed by um, Illinois, you know, statute and the rules of civil procedure. Um, and it has to go in front of a judge, you know, to make a decision. In some states, they have non-judicial foreclosures. I believe, I, I, want to say, I believe Texas is a non-judicial foreclosure state, but I'm not 100% sure, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have it here. I'm not super familiar with the process, but in non-judicial foreclosure states, the foreclosure process is way quicker, whereas a judicial foreclosure in Illinois typically takes a minimum of nine months. Um, so it, it goes way, it takes a really long time. Um, and then, yeah, so so with with the with a judicial foreclosure, it really is the, although it's a, there's a little bit, it's a little tougher for a bank to to grab that property back and it's a little bit more consumer friendly. Would you agree with that? 100%. Okay. And in some states, not non-judicial, the bank just basically moves in and starts to extricate, extricate you from the property using whatever means is legal for them. And they're not uh, limited by the court or any of the processes. So, and then to Lucas's point, you have the 90 day opportunity to, to um, reinstate and things like that. So there is some very good consumer protections in Illinois, uh, if you're working with an attorney to protect yourself and stay in your home, or even give yourself a little bit of time if you're going to move. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, the when I said that a judicial foreclosure typically takes nine months, that's nine months if somebody's walking in and they're not represented. Um, you know, maybe they walk in themselves and ask for a continuance or something. Uh, that that's basically from beginning to end the time period it takes. If you do have an attorney involved, I've seen foreclosures go you know, three years, um, you know, attorneys can ask for things like discovery and, you know, demand a trial and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So uh, we can do things to um, make the process take a little bit longer, which is usually great if the client is trying to do a short sale or something of that nature um, to extend the foreclosure. Or, you know, we can in fact fight the foreclosure. One of the neat things that happened uh, during the foreclosure crisis is that we actually fought some foreclosures and won. Uh, the banks, you know, were doing very sloppy work. That's why now, you know, there's been a, a big distancing from a full electronic closings and why when we do closings, we use blue ink. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being is because back in 2008, when we challenged all these foreclosures um, and we went to demand trials, we also asked that they bring the original documents to closing, which is a right under the Illinois Rules of Civil Procedure. Uh, the original documents upon the complaint being that they were founded on, which would be the promissory note and the mortgage. And a lot of the banks were unable to bring original documents. They'd either shredded them or just made them electronic copies, um, or they did bring something, but you couldn't tell if it was original because it was very faded. It looked like a photocopy uh, because typically everything was signed in black ink. Now mm -hmm. that everything is signed in blue ink, the blue ink is supposed to indicate that it's an original copy and then they store and, and keep those original copies now. Um, and that's supposed to you know, that was something that the banks did after us attorneys challenged and, and won a number of these foreclosure cases. Interesting. And and so, but the days of, um, 
you know, back in back in 08, you we you heard stories of people living in their home for four years, not making any payments and stalling things out. Is that still common today? Well, I, I mean, it's not I don't think it's common because there's not as many foreclosures before. Right. It was a lot easier because there were so many foreclosures in the system at that time that you could really just show up as an attorney to court, ask for uh, some extra time, file a motion to dismiss um you know do different things demand discovery and because the the docket was so large i mean the docket was ridiculous i mean you'd walk in they they used to most courthouses have these large sort of auditorium or ceremonial courtrooms uh and you know they're not normally used but on when the foreclosure call was so gigantic they were using those rooms it was the only room that was big enough to fit all the attorneys and all the people in um so yeah it was very easy to delay I mean, I still hear stories of people delaying, people being in their house for five years or something like that. But it's, I think, much more uncommon now. And, you know, because there's a much smaller court call and it's a lot easier for the judges to handle those cases and move them along. But I, I think you can eke out at least a couple of years pretty easily with an attorney. Okay, interesting. I, I think that right now the banks are tired of everything. And you had so many people that were on COVID relief, you know, deferments and, and whatnot that, they're not playing games these like they did before. They're not waiting. They mm. seem to be pushing full steam ahead on these foreclosures. Okay, wow. so that's a that's a key point, uh, Donna, because what that means is is that you don't have all this time to think to lally gag that you need to decide what you're going to do and then um, you know decide to go to short sale or whatever it might be. Yes, and and I'd say for all you agents and your attorneys. Um, what I'm seeing a lot of is I'm getting the short sale after they thought it was a regular sale. Order those payoffs ASAP because a lot of them have what they call a second principal balance. And that that money is not being charged interest. It doesn't need to be paid on, but it does need to be paid in full. So when people go, well, I only owe 200,000. In fact, they owe 280,000 with that second principal balance. And what's the second, What and what's that second payoff? It's, what is that? that that would be a COVID relief. You know, you haven't paid for oh. two years. You know, they're going to put that on, you know, saying, okay, you don't have to pay it back monthly, but it does need to be paid back. And, you know, in Illinois, that's a big deal. I mean, our property taxes, figure figure two, three years of just property taxes alone, more or less, you add the interest rate fees and whatnot in there. Those numbers get really big and people aren't acknowledging them. I think a lot of people think it's just going to go away, which it's I not. And it's, it is something, if you're working with an attorney, you should, you know, obviously the attorneys can do what they want, but you should recommend that your attorney order the payoff right away on any transaction. It's something that we do routinely. We order a payoff right when we get the file so we can make that determination. Right. The last thing you want to do is find out late into the transaction that they're upside down um, and that throws the whole transaction into disarray. So you want to make that determination right away. Yeah, and that leads us to kind of the idea of negative equity, right? Uh, be, and this is negative equity just based on the first mortgage in uh, in the uh, the collar counties. Five percent of the properties right now have negative uh, cook in the in the collar. Five percent of negative equity, and so you know that if, if property values drop, just more people fall into that bucket, and then you count these extra things, which are the COVID relief is uh, one of those, but also a lot of times the banks will have the actual payoff of the mortgage, but then they'll also have the legal uh, fees or whatever that they've racked up with the bank. And those the bank is not talking to each other. And all of a sudden that could show up as a surprise as well. Is that Does that happen often, Donna? You know, I usually get them when they're in short sale, when they're okay. going to be. So I don't normally yeah. see them. I Like I said, I've gotten them where everybody's in a panic because now it's a short sale where I think that could have been resolved by even just looking at a recent mortgage statement and yes. analyzing that statement. Um, Great. It's if, again, I'm going back to, if you think about it, somebody puts put 5% down three or four years ago and then didn't pay for two years. They're upside down. They're upside down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue. So then we have, um, we also have, uh, so we mentioned that Illinois is a state which all foreclosures are judicial. And uh, so deed in lieu, and that's basically a document that transfers the home's title from the homeowner to the bank that owns the mortgage in exchange for the mortgage being relieved. Do we see much of that now? And when does that option come up? You Lucas, know, you want to take that? Yeah, because because yeah, I was, I was going to say something that's kind of interesting on this topic. So a deed in lieu of foreclosure 
Um, you know, what it isn't is this, which I had happened to a commercial client that was a restaurant who had taken investment money from some investors and uh, as security for their investment, what they did was they agreed pursuant to an escrow agreement that the owner of the restaurant would give them a copy of the signed deed for the investors to hold an escrow. And at the time that there would be some type of breach or default on the repayment of the money, the investors would just record the deed wow. and now they're the owners. And you would think, first of all, well, if that was legal, why wouldn't every bank do that, right? You avoid the whole foreclosure process, avoid months, you know, years of foreclosure litigation, and you just take the deed. So that's not legal in, in Illinois. And that's why that process is not allowed. Um, if it would be, it would be great for any investor. Believe me, you'd see it all the time. This was kind of a rare circumstance that I saw come across my desk. Maybe they were thinking they could get away with it, uh, but we certainly, you know, stopped that as soon as it was done, filed a lawsuit to get the property back because unfortunately they did record that deed. Although, like I said, it was not valid. Mm. So as opposed to something that is legal, uh, a deed in lieu of foreclosure uh, is, is pretty much as, as simple as it states, uh, Instead of going through the foreclosure process, hey everyone, let, let's save the time of doing so, um, and 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 I'll give you the deed, essentially handing over the keys um, for satisfaction of the loan. Now, obviously, there's got to be some benefit to a homeowner. The benefit would be that the agreement for that deed in lieu of foreclosure would typically typically be structured that. Regardless of uh, the value of the property, so if it's underwater, it may not pay back the whole loan amount, but regardless, even if that's the case, um, you as the homeowner, the bank would have to agree, are not going to be personally liable for any deficiency, right? Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point of, of, of really doing that transaction? So the benefit of the homeowner, you're not going to be personally liable. You're off the hook. Bank, you take the property. You sell it, get as much of the loan paid back, and and I'm out of here. And the motivation for the bank is I don't pay as much in fees, and I don't get a destroyed property, right? Right. When all the, when is when the smoke clears. So that right. is. So how often do we see this deed in lieu happen as opposed to foreclosure or short sale? I mean, I, I would see it more often, uh, honestly, back in the day uh, with with commercial properties. Uh, I think that it would be yes. much more. That happens common. very often. Yeah. Yes. And, and you, you'll even stay in the property for a little while and maintain it, and just say, "Hey, when you know when you're ready, you, you move out." I mean, it's a very amicable thing with community banks or whatever it is. It happens right. often. And these are business decisions that are made by you know in commercial deals where you know, the, the 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 company that that whether it be an LLC or a corporation that is the, actually the mortgagor, the borrower. It's always going to be, there's always going to be an individual behind that loan guaranteeing it. And that individual doesn't want to suffer through, you know, a, a personal judgment for the balance of the loan. So it would be in their interest to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure. With residential um, property, on the other hand, it's not seen as, as often because uh, a lot of these people know that, well, they want to stay in the property as long as possible. Um, yeah. They think that they're, they're going to get away with and often do living rent free, mortgage free, potentially for years. Mm -hmm. And for them, um, they don't want to get out. And, and right. so why give up without a fight kind of thing, right? Right. Why give up without a fight and, and potentially even, you know, banks often number one are not going after personal judgments, personal, personal deficiencies. Um, I have, you know, I, I don't see that very frequently. I haven't seen that very frequently. They pretty much, once they get the property, that's what they'll be satisfied with. And they'll get the property back on the market and sell it. And whatever the, the sales proceeds are, will go towards paying off the loan. But they're not going to continue spending additional time and, and efforts um, going against the homeowner for personal deficiency. And, and, the, and, there, and as a result, the homeowner is willing to risk that and, and try to keep the property and stay in the property for as long as possible. If I could just make a point, um, 
on the deed and lose. It's not that simple where you sign a piece of paper, they, you know, you give them the keys and it's done. Because if you think about it, if it was that simple, everybody would just do it. Mm -hmm. um, but the process for a deed and lieu is very similar to the short sale. First and foremost, they do, they do that retention review. So pay stubs, bank statements, tax returns, the whole nine yards. Um, and I think a lot of people don't do the deed and lieu because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, the process is, you know, it's very similar, you guys. If you think about the process for a deed and lieu or a short sale, it, you're basically unapplying for the mortgage, right? Instead of trying to show the lender that you can afford to pay and you can get should get the money, it's, you're going to show to the lender that you can't afford to pay and they need to help you get out of it. But, you know, a lot of people seem to think that the deed and lieu process is simple, and it's not. I've done many of them, and I just bang my head against the wall going, really, could this lender get any, any more stupid? on what they're asking for. So I think yeah, so, that uh, so, I think and, you, and you, have, you have certain lenders that I call, I call them bottom feeders. So mm -hmm. sorry, Rushmore and you know, those, <laughs> that, you know, they bought these for pennies on the dollar and they want what they want because they want it. They want those houses back. Why yeah, and there's a, there's a piece of it. should do short sales is beyond me. Yeah, there's a piece of it uh, too, uh, Donna, that, um, that banks want to, they don't want to make it easy for you to just hand in your deed. They don't want to make it easy for you to short sale because they don't, they want the process to have some element of pain for the person that's reneging on their mortgage. I don't uh, know least, that I agree with that. Yeah, I don't agree with These you. These people no? are just, okay. they're too stupid. I hate okay. to say that, but <laughs> okay. they're, they're literally checking boxes. I see. And so if they don't, you know, people always ask me, well, how's Wells Fargo or how's Chase or how's this bank at your sales? You know, and my answer is the same all the time. It doesn't matter if it's Chase or Wells or Joe Blow's mortgage company. It matters who gets assigned to my file. So, you know, you have a few things here. One, did they start yesterday? They're totally clueless. Mm -hmm. Two, do they have um, too many files, you know, on their desk and they're overwhelmed? The third one. You know, do they have an attitude? And my favorite one, the fourth one, is do they just suck at their job? And mm. there is no in-depth thought process at these banks. Literally, it's just like nobody's in there. Right, they're big. So, so uh, uh, Kathleen Padilla, you raise your hand. Um, uh, if you could unmute, if you have a question, or you could just type it in the chat box too. Okay, let's continue. Um, so, uh, and then we have the consent uh, foreclosure, right? And the consent foreclosure, are most of the uh, foreclosures, guys, are most of them consent foreclosures? Um, I mean, I think most foreclosures are won by default. I don't think that they're consent, um, you know, but a, a client can consent to the foreclosure or basically just, you know, default out. I think that's the most common. Um, again, and and then it, it, just to step back really quick to the deed and lieu of foreclosure, mm -hmm. I just want sure. to mention that it's not 100% guaranteed that the bank will forgive the deficiency. And I just wanted to clarify that, especially if they're, if you have a client who's negotiating that on their own, you know, it, it's not a guarantee. And it's the same thing with a short sale. It's not a guarantee that there's a deficiency waiver. I, I've done, I don't know, hundreds of short sales, you know, with Donna over the years. And I think in that time, we've probably had three or four where they didn't forgive the deficiency. Well, um, you, it's PNC and BMO that. Yeah, that don't. That don't. Um, yeah. And, and the idea is when you, when, although when you short sale, the, for, the mortgage is no longer attached to the property, right? Because of the note, it is still attached to you personally. And so 100%. they have a right to pursue you because of the mortgage note you signed. And so even though you might be like, oh, great, I'm free and clear. That house is dumped. I'm out of it. That's it. Nope. That's not how it works. They have to agree to not pursue you for the note. Right. And, and back in the day, they, the banks were much more often willing to um, even give you money to get you out. But, you know, because, they, again, such a large caseload, they were paying so much money for attorneys. Um, that's less common now. Um, and same with Deed and Lou. Back in the day, it was a nice alternative because you could go to the bank and say, hey, I'm gonna, you want me to stay here for four years and you pay all these attorney's fees or I can leave right now. Why don't you give me a $10,000, you know, uh, relocation fee and I'll give you the Deed and Lou. And that was much more commonly accepted. Again, that's, it's, I think it's much less common now. Great. We have a couple of questions in the chat just real quick. So uh, Kathleen is asking, do you have to show uh, hardship? 
uh, for short sale or demo. And Donna, I think you were alluding to that, but is that a must that you must show uh, hardship? Here's the thing. Um, yes and no. You, ca you can't be current, okay, on your Yeah, mortgage. you have to not pay. To prove that you ca can't pay, you have well, to not pay. You right. can't just call them up and go, hey, I'm running short. I'm right. wondering if I don't pay you this month, if we could work. You, they, may, And that, that was really what I was getting to in terms of the pain process of it. The pain process is you have to blow up your credit. You have to not pay for us to engage with you right. in the foreclosure process. You know, I, I told them we're not just going to talk to you about how you know you're got a you got you need had a two thousand dollar auto bill to fix your car and you can't make your mortgage and we'll let you slide next month. No, that's not how it works. Well, and paying it's it's a contradiction in that hardship. Now you're mm -hmm. saying I can pay, I just don't want to for whatever reason. Right. That's really all it comes down to. Um, so that's that's a big thing as far as being current. As far as the hardship in itself. You know, people always get so dramatic on these hardship letters. And to me, it's like, no, here's what happened. Here's why I can't pay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Right. right. Just sweet to the point. It doesn't yeah. have to be. And that, yeah, that hardship can be something that's not something that most people would expect. I mean, Donna, we've had them before where we have, let's say somebody has to relocate to another state for their job and they're unable to sell their house. So now they have a new house or they're renting in a new place. And so they can no longer afford to pay the, the prior mortgage. That's a hardship. It doesn't, it it's not the kind of hardship like, oh, I've lost my job or I have cancer or I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm whatever, you know, people I think in their head think of. Legitimate. Yeah. 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 A hardship can be just as easy as I had to move to another state and now I've bought a new house and I can't afford to pay this new, uh, the old house. Mm -hmm. And I right. can't you sell it. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't need a you don't need a a real a good reason to default on your mortgage. That's not you definitely don't need right. You can. I, I don't even think they all the money in the world. Uh, so we have a couple of other questions real quick. So is there a difference between a consent foreclosure and a deed in lieu? Can you explain I was, that? I was, I was just going to jump in on, on that okay, topic. Great. That, great. That's interesting. Um, and I see your so question yeah. too, Rosa. So hold on. The, the difference, and that's a great question, uh, is that the consent foreclosure, it actually goes to a, to a court judgment. And why that's important is that when you have a consent foreclosure and you have a judgment of foreclosure in that regard, any other junior liens would be wiped out um, as, as opposed to if you have a, a, a deed in lieu of foreclosure, that is not typically a judicial judgment um, that, is, that is issued by the court. Great. And when we talk about a consent foreclosure, the person who's consenting is the homeowner, right? That they're consenting that, that uh, right? They're saying, I accept that uh, this foreclosure, they're consenting to it as opposed to fighting it tooth and nail and making it contentious. They're saying, I give up, I agree, foreclose upon me. Is that right? Absolutely. Provided that you don't come after me for it. Provided that you don't it. come after me with a deficiency judgment yes. after the fact. So that's, that's the exchange of it. I can battle you and all that. And we have someone that says PNC, because uh, Donna, you mentioned PNC. Uh, Rosa has a short sale with PNC right now. Are you saying that PNC is a hard line about pursuing this? If, if it's judgment? if it's if it's private paper, <coughs> um, so of course, if it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, whatever, they have to follow those guidelines. But a lot of PNC is private paper, and BMO at least. They put it right out there. They state it. They, you know, we are not going to waive our right to uh, the deficiency. We are keeping our right to sue you. I think PNC, they jump around it and try to pretend like they are. So in their initial approval letter, it'll say, we, uh, upon receipt of the funds, we will release the lien and report to the credit bureaus as um, settled for less than full balance. But they're not releasing the deficiency. Okay, so that's a key point. That's, that's why you have to have sneaky. That's they're why you have to have sneaky. an attorney that knows what they're doing. Otherwise, yes. you're left a little bit in a lurch. So now PNC will allow you to buy that deficiency waiver. They'll come up with a number, and if that homeowner is willing to give them that five, ten grand, or whatever, they'll waive the deficiency. BMO Harris will not do that until after it closes. And then, um, you know, if they start hounding you, you have the right to try and settle that open balance with them. 
But those okay, are just the it. two biggest yeah. that I. So that so that's a key note if you're an agent and you're trying to get into the short sale business because you don't want someone who you've helped with a short sale call you up later and go, hey, what the heck's going on? BMO is pursuing me for twenty grand, right, uh, or two hundred and- grand. And what's going on here, you know? And then you're like, oh, I didn't know they could do that or whatever. So that's why the key is to have the experts here. Yes, and if they have that, I make sure the attorneys, I'm like, y'all need to drop a separate document covering your butts, that they're stating that they understand that. And in the approval letter where it says, have them initial that paragraph, you know, just cover your butt as far as what they're going to say. But do know the PNC is sneaky. Okay, is there is... Oh, is so there know. any way? Well, one more question they had is: Is there any way to know that it's private paper? Well, the first thing that I do, you know, is when I do any short sale, I send out an authorization form and a basic information sheet. And the first thing I do is look it up to see if it's Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Mm. Um, and if it doesn't come up on Fannie or Freddie, and it's not FHA or VA, which you can usually tell from a mortgage statement. Mm. Um, then that's the then first thing to do. Paper. Look it up yeah. to see if yeah. Then it then it defaults. It's it's private paper. And, well, and I'll head job. One of the things that I often do when a client approaches or when a broker, I'm sorry, approaches me, a real estate agent, and and they're you know working with me on a regular basis, and they want to do a short sale, or they're they're maybe going to a listing appointment with somebody, and the property is going to be a short sale. Is I get Donna involved in that transaction immediately, even at the listing appointment, where Donna can talk to those people and try to evaluate the situation, so everybody has a better understanding if this is going to be successful right out of the get go, because you don't want to really spend time and resources on a transaction that you know from the beginning is just not going to be happening. And that's, you know, Donna is fantastic in that way. Um, and that's why I'm so glad we work so closely together on those types of issues. Awesome. Well, and, uh, uh, go ahead, Donna. I was just going to say, Mike and I have probably closed over 5,000 short sales from at this point. So mm-hmm. uh, I guarantee we've seen it all. Well, that's great. So, let, and, and so just so we know a short sale, and that's the last uh, bullet point on this page, is a home that's sold prior to foreclosure so that you get in there and you're able to do that. And that if, if agents are looking to be in that business, just know that you have to have this team of experts in place, bec- uh, including, you know, if you're working with your, with your land trust sales rep, we can do some uh, title due diligence prior to so that you can see what you're into too. And so you know, and then yeah. there's there's another thing you have to add to that. It's not just a home sold prior to foreclosure. It's a home sold prior to foreclosure for less than the amount that's owed. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, yeah, for less than the amount that's owed. That's great. Yeah, that's the short sale. Another mm-hmm. another thing we haven't addressed about really uh, any of these avenues is they all pretty much will affect your credit rate. Yes. Right. So it, it it's not the case unfortunately that if you go with a deed in lieu or consent foreclosure that there is no history of of you being in this situation and and an, uh, uh you know a blemish on your on your credit it's it's going to happen yeah there's going to be an impact thank you lucas uh, that's a great point okay so uh we're going to buzz through this here i know that we got 15 minutes and uh this is great very robust i love it um so let's talk about just these foreclosure documents and if any of these are relevant uh, to the homeowner. We have the complaint of foreclosure of mortgage. We have the summons. We have the motion for default. We have a motion for entry of an order of foreclosure and then the order of foreclosure. Is there anything here that you uh, guys think an agent needs to know in, uh, when they're dealing with their when they're dealing with the sellers, when they're dealing with buyers? Uh, of a of a short sale property, right? Is there anything that uh, the agents need to know about this so that they can uh, just you know, uh, you know, no. not mess no. up? Not really. It's just a matter of knowing where they are in the process. Yes. You know, we'll often get you know it happens. Unfortunately, we'll get a short sale and it's already gone to judicial sale, mm-hmm. um, and it's already too late for us to do that. So there's a time period after the judicial sale, but before it's confirmed where it's still in the court, but really the time for a short sale, once it's gone through judicial sale is, is kind of kaput. The judge oftentimes will not allow us to go to short sale at that point. Um, and so uh, and Jeff, if you can clarify the judicial sale, the judicial sale is that they've uh, had the court order to be able to sell the property and the property yeah, is going to auction. And typically 
uh, you either have investors showing up at this auction or the bank is the one that's buying this back because they don't want to lose their shirt uh, shorts on the deal, right? Right. On residential transactions, 99% of the time, it's the bank buying it it's back. It's the bank that's buying it um, And so, yeah. So after the judicial sale, there's a confirmation of sale. They have to file a motion. It takes 30 days. Um, and so that... Uh, it, that that's at that point it's really too late if if you can get even us if Brazil, even if the bank buys it back is it too late it's too late for that seller to get off yes. the night and go oh, blah 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 this they're like the, the toothpaste is out of the tube mm -hmm. right the right to their their right to redeem is expired at the point and um really it's it's too late so what we like to do is if we can figure out so these these documents don't really matter what you know but it's what's important is you know in the short sale process is where they're at and like i said in, in the the whole you know, the whole foreclosure process. And if we find out that they're right at the edge of the time period, we can always go in and, you know, to court file a motion and ask to delay the sale and, and show the court we have a valid contract. Um, you know, this it's going to close within 45 days. Uh, we'd ask that the sale be, you know, delayed while we negotiate the, the short sale. Um, the judicial sale be delayed at the auction. And oftentimes the court will allow that. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, and that, that gives us extra time and we can get that short sale to go through, but it is, uh, there's two sort of independent paths happening while we're negotiating a short sale, right? We're negotiating a short sale. The bank doesn't stop the foreclosure process, the judicial process. They're still going forward and whichever one kind of finishes first, typically Wait. what's going to win. Um, but again, the judges, the courts are very keen to allow a short sale for the most part. So if we go in on a motion and appear and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is where we're at. We've been working diligently with the bank, uh, you know, and uh, we have a valid contract here. We have a, a buyer who's chomping at the bit to get this property. The courts will oftentimes delay the process to allow us to, to finish the short sale. And, uh, and Jeff, um, is, um, is uh, typically these are two different departments that don't even know what stage each of them are in, right? Is that right? <laughs> Donna could talk to that probably best. Yeah. Yeah. Department A never knows what department yeah. B is doing. And so and you if, can't you can't you can't expect because I'm successful on the short sale side that the side that is charged with taking the home back on behalf of the bank is going to stop anything until they get legally cut off from it, type of thing. Right. And that's why sometimes we've had issues where the bank has gone into properties that are under foreclosure. Um, and we're trying to effectuate a short sale and they go in and they'll like winterize the property or something uh, because they are, that foreclosure team wants to protect the property, protect their asset. So they'll, they'll come into the property and do things like that when we're in the process of trying to sell it, which it oftentimes causes problems when they walk in and start doing stuff like that, or they'll remove furniture, just weird stuff like that can kind of happen because A doesn't know what B is doing. We've had that happen a lot over the years. It happened a lot more back when the crisis was happening because again, there was just so many more cases out there. And so they were losing track of them, but that is not an uncommon thing. One, one other thing in this process that uh, I think many people, maybe homeowners, non-attorneys would don't know, and, and not only in foreclosure, but any type of litigation is when you're, when the, the summons, you have that as a bullet point, right? So when does the case start? When do you have any obligation to do anything in this case? Well, it's not until you're formally served and the 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 way the reason I say formally served is because there is you know only a certain number of ways for you to be actually handed or or not personally handed necessarily, and I'll get into that, but tendered this foreclosure lawsuit in order for there to be any obligation for you to start doing anything. So if you get it in the mail, uh, you know even if it's certified, et cetera. It doesn't mean you've been served and you have to do anything. Or you, if you happen to get it some other way, maybe your bank gets it to you. That's I've seen that happen many times. That doesn't mean you were served and it doesn't start the clock on, on your obligation to, to do the next step, which is file an appearance in the case. In order to be served, typically, well, in Cook County especially, the, the, the Cook County Sheriff has to get a first crack at it, right? So they would serve you and it has to be served at your place of abode uh, and hand it to a person doesn't have to be you personally. It has to be someone 13 years of age or older in the residence where you reside. And, and some people will then often say, well, no one gave it to me. And I say, well, that doesn't have to happen. As long as it's given to someone 13 years of age or older where you reside, you've been served. 
Other times, if the if the sheriff tries and doesn't and is not successful, the bank will hire a, a, a process server, a special process server, which is a private company. No different uh, than what the sheriff would do other than they don't work for the government. And then they would try to find you. They could, if you're not successful at, at home, they could find you at work, in which case, if you're at work, they can't hand it just to anyone. They would have to hand it to you personally. So in, in terms of you know, there being a strategy of delay in these types of foreclosures, um, don't don't jump in the case if, you're, if your strategy is to delay if you haven't been formally served yet. Right, awesome. but make sure you monitor your case, right? Because just because you don't believe you've been served doesn't mean that the other side won't tell the court. Absolutely, that that's a good point too. The, the other side may even have an affidavit of service and which may, may be incorrect intentionally or, or just by mistake and the court proceeds then. Although then you should at least typically get a motion of default sent to your home, at which case you would you would then wake up and say, hey, judge, why is there a motion of default? I haven't even been served in this case. Correct. Uh, so one of the questions that we have is uh, a particular case, and we may want to take this offline. It says, the short sale I have with PNC, this is great for our group to learn from, uh, had a bankruptcy, and the relief of stay was just listed, uh, lifted. They denied the modification to begin with. That is why she went BK. Now they want her to go through the mod review again before they consider the short sale, which is what you were talking about, Donna. Just the kind of qualification thing. And it says, my question is, why would they do that again? A few years ago, the uh, federal government decided that we were all too stupid to decide for ourselves whether or not we wanted to try to keep our house or sell it. Mm -hmm. So although it is a guideline, it is not a law. It does state that every homeowner should first and foremost be reviewed for home retention, whether they want it or not. If, the, if they are approved for a loan modification prior to selling, the homeowner can decline that modification and it'll move on to short sale. Um, if they're denied, obviously it'll move on to the short sale review. But really that's the unapplying part too, you know, trying to show them what you can, what you have and just checking off boxes. Some of the, your lenders don't do it. They don't file, follow that guideline, but the majority of your big banks do. Um, so you can opt out after you've been approved, but you cannot opt out prior to even if you file the bankruptcy. And can I can I go a little bit deeper in that a little bit? When, when Donna talks about unapplying for the mortgage or for a, the short sale, what she means is that a short sale is just almost like a mortgage where you have to go through all these, jump into these hoops to apply. You have to, you know, send bank statements and, and paycheck stubs and tax returns and all that. When you go through a short sale, you're in essence unapplying for a loan. You have to send them the exact same stuff. And I think that's the biggest point that we have that's an issue with short sales and getting them approved is, is compliance with the, the client wanting to comply. Because oftentimes if a client is in a deep, you know, horrible financial situation, which has forced them to get to a short sale, they're not really keen on jumping through those hoops. Everyone's excited to buy a house. Everybody runs to get all their stuff over to the lender. When they're going through the short sale process, sometimes people tend to shut down which is why we need to make sure to educate them upfront before they get into this process as to what to expect and make sure that they're on board. The last thing you wanna do is waste your time and resources, again, uh, marketing and, and working on a property when a client is divorced from the process and they're really not interested. Because yeah, that's yeah, never gonna get approved, you're gonna lose. That's a, that's a great point, Jeff. It takes a special kind of person to get into the, the mire here. You know, it's like a divorce attorney almost, right? In many ways, you see a lot of divorce attorneys like I was just so tired of doing it, you know, because I couldn't, uh, the emotional energy. There's a lot of emotional energy to this, to getting these deals across the finish line and not all of them get across the finish line. And you're dealing with people that aren't paying their mortgage for whatever reason. And so you're wondering why they didn't follow through with you. They're not following through is why they are, in this predicament to begin with in some name. I know there's certain circumstances and calamities and we've all had them, but anyway, okay. Um, so let's just talk about this really quick. This is just a short point. You know, all of these roads, whether judicial, non-judicial, deed in lieu or short sale, uh, they all lead to ultimately the, if you do not redeem the short sale, it leads to the sell of the property and that you have to vacate. Like that's the end of the road. Am I correct there, guys and gals? Yes. Okay, right. I mean, that's it. 
So that's the end of the road. How you want to get there is up to you in some ways, you know, whether, you know, these kind of things. And I know in Illinois, the non-judicial is not, not the case. So let's take a look at some of these last things that I want to bring up on. And this is our, really our last slide or, or we're getting right to the end. Um, you know, short sale, we're defining it. It's an offer of a property at an asking price that is less than the amount due. Jeff, you talked about that. You got to have your expert team in place. You know, you can see these folks here on the call, Jeff, Lucas, Donna, they know their craft. They've been here, done that. You don't want to have uh, your attorney Googling things, uh, you know, after he gets off the phone with you to figure out what the next steps are. You want the people that uh, know what their position is. Uh, the pros of a short sale, um, particularly for buyers are that you might get a property that's in better condition than foreclosed properties because typically the homeowner is still in it. It's not always this way. Would you guys say that's a general truth? On a short yeah, sale? I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've walked into ones once the bank had them um, and, and seen, you know, mice in the bathtub and- uh, When they take in a bath, hey, at least they, they were clean mice, they, right? They had the water running and, and <laughs> bubbles going. So they were enjoying themselves. <laughs> uh, so I, I, the time frame, uh, you know, for an investor to buy short sales, you do have a lot of time in between the time that you make your offer and, the t you know, uh, and the time that the short sale goes through to prepare yourself uh, for um, doing the construction, and things like that. So there is an advantage from that standpoint. Um, are there discounts involved? If you're a buyer of short sale properties, are there potential discounts involved? No, it, okay. it typically costs, there's more fees because the bank will disallow certain fees from the seller side that have to be paid. And then those fees get pushed over onto the buyer side because there's no other way around it. So if you're typically um, a buyer of a short sale, you have to account for that you're gonna pay more than the purchase price well, potential. Okay, if you work with me and Donna, that doesn't happen so much. But if you work okay. with other people and they negotiate, that does happen. One yeah. of the things that we do and Donna is really great at is she spends a lot of time uh, thinking about the numbers before she submits them to the bank. And so she'll oftentimes sort of uh, put in an, a higher uh, tax proration uh, you know, because we don't know when it's really going to close. So she estimates sort of a larger tax proration, assuming it's going to close later or that the taxes are gonna go up. And so there's usually a, a way more money in the tax bucket that can be used to offset any costs that would normally be spent by the buyer. Um, and so that's that's one of the tricks yeah. that you'll do. Uh, right, but, but, thing, but, but Jeff, I just wanna, I don't mean to interrupt, but in this case, if not, you know, who knows who's negotiating the short sale on the other side, right? Because if you're representing the buyer, okay, of the short sale, how do you avoid those extra fees? Is there a way to do that? It's you tough. don't. You're, you're at tough. the mercy of whoever's okay. doing that short sale and whether okay. or not that person knows. And it's tough for, if you're a it. buyer, it's tough to control who's on the other side negotiating the short right. sale. In fact, so that I, would be something you want to find out is who's, who's, who's driving the bus of the short sale because right. I could wind up get, paying more for this property because they're inept. I just got a short sale contract that I sent to Donna uh, where we were representing a buyer and I wanted her to see it because I thought it was crazy. And it in that crazy. contract, it, it specifically <laughs> said that the bank is not going to pay any tax prorations at all. Um, and so, you know, that's okay, something that's so, so negotiable. That, that's, that that's that's negotiator a, doesn't yeah. negotiate them. So yeah. that's, another, that's another due diligence point that uh, whoever's, on, uh, you know, these agents that are on here, hundred and some odd agents, if they don't have the right attorney on the buy side of a short sale, you may not know what you don't know. So it's really important, you know, just be, you know, it's not just important for sellers to employ the proper team. It's important for buyers to employ the proper team. It, for it, sure. It's the wild, wild west, I would say. And and one one point in this is, you know, there, there's procedures, there's things like we go through the regular closings that things are very customary, right? Who pays what, it's very customary, uh, pays for the survey, et cetera. But in short sales, it, it's all for grabs. It's okay, great. So buyer beware, but seller beware. Up for grabs also depends on um, expertise. Like we know who the problem children are, mm -hmm. okay, so to speak. So which of the banks are going to fight numbers to the T and, you know, want, want just to walk away with bank? You know, I mentioned Rushmore as an example. Um, I had one not that long ago where uh, the, the property appraised at 120 and they wanted to net. 160. Okay, that's impossible. 
So you just know who the, those problem children are and adjust accordingly um, and awesome. see how it goes from there. Right, okay, and I so that I mentioned that I've been on the buy side of transactions before. And one of the things that I'll always do is I'll call the other attorney and ask them who they have negotiating, what their experience is negotiating short sales. And if they don't really know what they're doing, I'll bring Donna into the transaction to negotiate it, even though then she's kind of- Yeah, I've had that. Side. I've had that happen just because, you know, we want to make sure it gets done. And you'll say to the attorney, listen, I've got somebody who's fantastic, who can negotiate this, even though, you know, she normally negotiates for me. Uh, you know, I can lend her over to you. You'll love her. She'll be fantastic and she'll get this done. And uh, oftentimes attorneys will chomp at the bit for that. They'll love that. So a couple of comments. Um, uh, one agent says, I found that banks won't accept more than 100% prorated taxes for a short sale. Is that true? That's in their letter, but um, there's only one lender out there that actually knows how to calculate them and that's Wells Fargo. So <laughs> Okay, so that's <laughs> not of necessarily them, yeah. true. Okay, great. And then another one says nine out of 10 times it comes out of the buyer's agent. Uh, when they don't know what they're doing, and that sucks. That that could that could be true. Do you mean that they're hitting the buyer's agent to cover fees? Yes. Yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. I got to be really desperate to even ask that. It's a numbers game, and if you can position those numbers accordingly, right? You okay. just got, it is a game. It's a game. Great. We're up against the time. I want to finish up here. So uh, some of the cons could be, we talk about this, it's competitive. There's a, the, you know, it is a competitive market. There's a lot of people in the short sale business in terms of buyers looking for a deal, right? Uh, it's slow. It could take three to 12 months to approve. Is that right? I say your typical short sale takes 90 to 120 days from the date that I get the seller's documentation to submit it. You know, okay. sometimes longer, some, it, how many problems do you have? Are you fighting value? You know, all of that yep. comes into play. Uh, yeah. Hurdles, paperwork, red tape, and then they're unreliable. You, you, there is a fallout here of uh, success on short sales. And get, w w is there a number that you, that you would say, is it one of two that uh, don't go, the one of two that decide the short sale, don't get it to the short sale finish line? Or what are those numbers, guys? I mean, one out of 10, one out of 20, how much? right? As long as the, the client provides all the information that yeah. they're being asked to provide, it almost always gets approved. Okay. Um, yeah. The only time I don't see them get approved are, um, it comes down to numbers, you know, if, if we can't make those numbers work. And sometimes it's the buyer that doesn't want to spend more. Sometimes it's a lender that really sucks. And then well, Rushmore, right, Donna? Can I, can I give land trust a, a little plug here really quick? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when you talk about having your expert team in place, you know, it's great. I'd love to work every single short sale, you know, and have Don on every single short sale. I know it's not going to happen, but one of the great things about it is I, I can tell you, I send, um, almost every single one of my short sales to land trust. And there's a reason why, um, you know, they are really in a great position to be very quick and responsive uh, with uh, our short sale transactions. And, you know, as much as I like, you know, sometimes other title companies will refer business to me or whatever, and I want to use them. I don't use them for my short sales because it takes such a long time to get responses and to uh, make things happen. And these short sales, sometimes we really, you have to get something to the bank in a, in a couple hours or, whatever it takes to get that short sale approved or else it could go to foreclosure and you can lose the transaction. And it's, land trust is really positioned to be able to get that resolved, partly because they're smaller, so they're more responsive, but also we have people like Steve and Carmen who are just absolutely fantastic in when there's a problem, we can call them directly. I have Steve's cell phone number, you know, and, and all the attorneys who work with them, uh, you know, will have that information, same with Carmen, and we can get things pushed through and get changes made immediately. Um, which is so, so important when negotiating these transactions. And so I really just want to give kudos uh, to Land Trust and why I really like working my short sales with Land Trust and why they're part of the expert team that you need to have in place. Thank you. Very well put. But you forgot the most important thing, Jeff. Having See, Donna ordering title through Land Trust makes Donna happy. And when Donna's happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> there you go. I love that. Um, Guys, I just can, want to bring up one thing that wasn't... Session. Based on what I'm hearing, we can extend this session for another half hour and just talk about it. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Donna. Can I what just bring up one thing and then I'm yes. good. Um, the one thing that we didn't bring up as far as the pros for a short sale is that the feds have extended the Mortgage Debt Relief Act through 2025. And yeah. so as long as that property is 
owner occupied was owner occupied um there's no tax consequences so. wow so guys i want to thank you very much uh donna that's great i want to uh, there's something that placed in my mind i'm glad i had this on here is junior lien holders talk about uh we, we still have most of our uh, group here and i think it's important if there's a junior lien holder we said they go away do they go away or do they just get pushed off out of the deal but still are lurking in the shadows yeah they fight they fight they will they will fight because you know by by law once the foreclosure happens they are wiped away so um that's another thing to consider and make some of these other avenues deed and lose uh, not even an option because you, you would still have a second lien ho holder to deal with um, with consent foreclosures as well, they don't they don't want the property the 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 homeowner consenting to it with the primary lien holder because then they would get wiped out because as I mentioned before, that is a judgment that that comes out of that um, procedure. So the junior lien holders will definitely fight, but that's something that the primary lien holder will have to take into consideration as well and potentially throw some money at them in order to uh, make them go away. Okay, and when they go away, that means they, they don't have recourse after the close of the sale, is that right? Correct. But they still have the note. So like BMO is- It's has, the lien that the, goes away. The lien wow. that goes away, but that homeowner still is liable for that Absolutely. debt. And Absolutely, And banks, the smaller banks like BMO, which isn't that small, but you know, your smaller banks especially, they're actually suing for breach of contract. So. Okay, so those are those are things to consider. If you have a second mortgage on it, it doesn't just go away because the property sold. And you think that's there's still some issues with that. Okay, great. And then finally, uh, you know, chapter thirteen. So bankruptcy. Um, uh, we talked about deficiency judgments, but talk about just what what the role finally what the role of bankruptcy can do to a foreclosure. Can it stop it? You know, uh, what, what, how do you see that playing out? I mean, it definitely pauses the, the transaction typically while the bankruptcy is in place, unless the lender goes into the bankruptcy and asks to be able to proceed forward. Yes. Yes. So, so the lender will typically see that bank, the lender will typically see that bankruptcy and then go into the court and file a motion, right? To continue the foreclosure. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that's typical. And that's a that's another linchpin point where your bankruptcy attorney can attempt to um, negotiate some sort of resolution with the bank at that point. So sometimes they'll exclude the bank from the well, bankruptcy uh, and the, that that loan and allow you to stay in the house because you'll pay that loan, uh, but you'll bankrupt out of the rest of your debt. So it's something that can be negotiated. It's sort of outside of my hands or Donna's hands at that point. Uh, but sometimes the bankruptcy attorney can negotiate some sort of resolution that's kind of if, separate. If nothing else, I've had attorneys file the bankruptcy just to delay the, the auction so that yeah, the short sale can get pushed through. That's what I was going to mention, too, yeah. is once once the bankruptcy is filed, there's what in place what's called an automatic stay. Mm -hmm. So that stay means everything is frozen. The, the That debtor is untouchable, not only from this uh, lender with, with their mortgage, but from any other creditor that they may have. They are untouchable. They cannot be collected against. No enforcement proceedings can be continued or initiated against that person until the automatic stay is lifted. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what a bank would have to do is go into bankruptcy court and lift that automatic stay. As Donna mentioned, yeah, the, the, some people in, in, in dire, desperate uh, need of, of delaying and staying in their home will file a bankruptcy that may not actually be one that they're going to continue with, but for the reason that it stops everything, they'll do it to buy time. And it yep, buys right. a lot of time. Yes. Oh, okay, so that brings us to the end. This is chock full, a lot of stuff. And, you know, uh, so we've had a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, one is uh, making sure they get the information of everyone on the call, which we'll definitely get that. We're happy to get to them. Second thing is, can they get the presentation? We'll send you out the notes to the presentation um, as well. But here's what I would really encourage you to do. If you're going to be in the short sale game at all, if you're going to deal with buyers or sellers of short sales, and you really want to 
start building your expertise or you have a certain predicament or a certain scenario, I would recommend getting in touch with Lucas and Jeff. You know, they'll work with uh, Donna as they see fit. But I'd recommend work, uh, get, have, grabbing a cup of coffee with them and just talking to them about what you what kind or, or do a, a, a quick a Zoom meeting talking about what kind of profile of business. Maybe you have an active client that you need to get, uh, you know, resolution on or whatever. So we'll make sure you get that information, uh, their contact information, because they really are the resource. You know, everything on the slide here, they know uh, times 100. You know what I mean? And so um, I just really want to uh, encourage you to reach out. And if you were invited by one of our sales reps, well, there's other attorneys that they're partnering with as well that uh, are uh, can be great resources for this niche. And we just wanted to really raise up and lift up a couple that we know uh, and that we're able to uh, be a resource for us today. So I want to say to um, Donna, thank you very much for adding all your expertise. We really appreciate it. Lucas, we appreciate uh, you taking the time out to be on the call and just adding your thoughts. And thank Jeff, you, of course, we thank you uh, for your contribution and just uh, for, you know, just the, really the work that you're doing in the real estate community. We appreciate you. And thanks a lot, everyone. And we yeah. thank you. Uh, what? Let's see here. Yep. They work. Uh, uh, we asked, do they work in McHenry County? Yes. Oh, yes. They do, right. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, so. Um, oh, great. You know what? Hey, uh, what, if you guys want to give out your, uh, Jeff, just really give out your phone number really quick. That's great too. Yes. Know? That would be great. Sure. Yeah. My phone number is 312-208-7340. Again, that's 312 312- Two zero eight seven three four zero, and that's my direct cell. I don't have an office line. I just have the cell because I'm always in closings. So you can even text me at that number if you have a question. Just let me know where you know me from or who you are. Um, and let me give you Donna's phone number as well if you want to reach out to her directly. She's at 847-464-5015. And that's the best way to get a hold of Mike or Donna. Great. And Lucas, why don't you give your number as well? 847 305 3030847305303030 that is just as good as calling my cell phone because it goes to my cell phone um so anytime i will be available and i'm at 8675309 i don't know if anyone remembers that <laughs> and mine I'm is kidding. not a cell phone. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> <laughs> all right hey guys thank you so much this was a great uh, session we appreciate all of our agents and uh, let's be optimistic out there. There's a lot of people to help. There's a lot of business being done, a lot of deals going. And so great work. And everyone got better today. And so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having, thank us, for having us. And thank yeah. you, Land Trust. Yep. Yeah. Bye.